Benvenuti su Mito Dolcino, io sono Simone Mariam. Oggi insieme a me condurrà Marco Rocco, ingegnere ed esperto di economia e di geopolitica. È tornato da noi Matt Eret, giornalista, scrittore, docente e storico. Ricordiamo che è contributore regolare di Strategic Culture ed è il fondatore di Rising Tide Foundation. Hi Matt, welcome back to our program. How are you? Hi Simone, hi Marco, I'm very well, thank you. Thank you very much for having accepted our invitation. I would like to start to open our interview uh, with a very hot topic, the constant increase in prices. How can stagflation impact countries with a fixed currency like the euro? Well, I, I think that there's, a, there's many moving parts to, your, your, the, to answer that question, <clears throat> but I believe that, I mean, we're being told a lot of myths by the, the myth makers who are currently telling us what the world is actually uh, being governed by. And, um, and if you listen to most people who are part of the, the mainstream economic class that are, that are you know, sitting in Brussels or in, in New York or wherever, they will often say that the, the only cause of inflation is you know, central banks printing money and that causes inflation. They'll even say, though, that there is no inflation, as, as Marco was pointing out in our, our little discussion. They'll say that that's an illusion. There's really no inflation. That's, that's just uh, because people's wages aren't going up at uh, the same rate. And then they'll explain it away. But the reality is, obviously, when you go to the grocery store, when you're a, 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 an entrepreneur needing to buy your supplies, maintain overhead costs, you're interacting with the real world and you're obviously seeing serious issues of inflation. The buying power of dollars, of euros, are, are going down. Energy prices are going up. And I, I think that the way I would address this on two levels is that, well, number one, the principal thing that people always have to keep in mind, which is always left out of these conversations in the mainstream, is the issue of the physical productive base. If, you're, if your economy has a shrinking productive industrial power, which is being shut down, then it, any type of money in circulation is going to lose its uh, value. It'll lose its ability to buy what you could have bought 10 years earlier, you know, and that's what's been going on now for 40 years straight. But it's accelerating now the shutdown of the physically productive manufacturing sectors. Um, why? Well, there's a variety of reasons. On the one hand, for 40 years, we've been exporting our industrial base to poor countries for cheap labor reasons. Right. That's been something that's been a sickness that we've been succumbing to since the early 70s internationally. Um, but more, more recently, we've really been induced to, to drink a green poison of renewable energies, which we know across Europe, you, you have skyrocketing energy prices. And when you're a, a manufacturer, if you're a company, uh, it costs a certain, you need a lot of energy to produce. And if the energy prices are going up through, through legitimate or artificial means, because I think that the, the current energy crisis in, in Europe and which is striking North America where I live, is artificially being induced. Um, for example, having windmills and solar panels, you know, Britain relies on 25% of its energy for windmills, which are notoriously unreliable. They, you know, when the wind doesn't, doesn't blow, it can go down to less than 1% uh, capacity. That's a huge liability. So on the one hand, when you have crises like that, or when, when the sun doesn't shine and your, your solar panels don't produce electricity, obviously this, this creates a scarcity, which increases prices. Um, And don't tell me that it's about fossil fuel or stopping fossil fuels, because every time you build these windmills and solar panel you know, farms, you need to have a lot of backup fossil fuel power because, again, it's known that they generally don't produce their full capacity. They produce maybe 24% on the best days. Um, so you always need to have expensive backup, and it's, it's very unreliable. So when you're, again, a company that's producing whatever, tires or, or whatever you our society produces so much uh, to sustain 8 billion lives. And when the energy prices go up, obviously the, the prices of goods will increase. And I'm not even talking about the money printing yet because, you know, we have also been, as everybody should know, since 2008, when we lost the economy in a, in a very serious way, the financial system blew out. We never repaired it in 2008. There's been an ongoing rate of, of atrophy of the real world that we live in infrastructure has been permitted to decay, right? Uh, the shutdown of the real economy while money printing has gone up. So we've got infusions of bailouts to, to, to keep too big to fail banks alive. And since COVID was launched onto us, uh, the US debt has skyrocketed to $28 trillion. We've printed $4.5 trillion to just infuse mostly into the speculative banks that gambled and lost. 
Um, and this is obviously another variable, which is we, you have to bring this into the equation in terms of what's causing the inflation. So there's many moving parts, but the key thing is you, if you shut down the physical economy, you will lose your buying power. Money will not give you what it did give you when you were, when you had a healthier economy and, uh, and you will enter into increasing rates of hyperinflation even, which is, I think where we're currently moving towards is a state where the acceleration of inflation goes from one rate of change to a much greater intense hyperbolic rate of growth like we saw in 1923 Germany. That's a danger I think that people have to really think about. I think I agree 100% you know to what you're saying. Um, uh, the point is that today we have inflation. Okay? Forget mm -hmm. about that thing because uh, uh, I, I cannot believe the story that uh, um, no, uh, no salary increase, no inflation. Okay, inflation is about prices. If prices are going up, you know, there is inflation. Okay. Uh, make a long story short. Uh, the point is that this inflation is causing, um, let's say, uh, stagflation or something worse. In my opinion, next year, companies, at least in Europe, will be unable to pass through this, this extra cost from energy, from uh, raw materials and, uh, and uh, shortage of labor and uh, shortage of merchandise you know, from China. So we are going to have, you know, a price increase, but without an increase in salary, okay? So what's going to cause this, you know? In United Kingdom, for example, with pound, I expect a kind of stagflation, as Lord Skidassi was saying, uh, due to the fact that being able to fine tune your own tax policy, fiscal policy, and uh, also currency, you can say, on some extent, challenge, uh, having, you know, some damage, you know, like control damage. I'm very much worried about Europe, especially peripheral Europe con con countries, because uh, they are totally unable to fine-tune fiscal policy and fine-tune the currency. In these countries, I expect something much worse. It's going to be inflation plus depression. So uh, inflationary depression. Mm -hmm. um, if this thing happens, you know, I, I feel that uh, central bankers are going to be blamed. And uh, I feel the politician and and say central bankers are on the, on the same boat in order to defend their own say armchair in order not to be chased by people because is this thing if this thing happened and is we are just in a month uh, from checking if this is true or not you know um, people are going to be very upset uh, let, let's see but nobody wants to speak about inflation today this is a matter of fact okay in the in the, in the government. Only Germany is starting to speak about inflation due to the fact that they realize the, the, the Swiss recipe. The Swiss recipe is something very, very easy. Um, from last March to today, the Swiss franc has increased 6% versus Euro. This means that you have 6% less inflation in Switzerland than in, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, for example. Um, uh, this is a big issue because... Uh, uh, Switzerland can challenge inflation, and today inflation is much a, a bigger threat to to export countries than uh, it is, for example, a stronger currency. Because the first point is to avoid inflation to get out out of your hands. You know, then you can improve your uh, price offering due to to your currency. But right. it's a big issue. I we ex I'm on the same school of uh, Tom Longo basically that we we hope we are, we are going to meet very soon because. Uh, uh, the long is saying that at the end, you know, Germany will leave Europe due to this mess. Uh, we agree 100%. The, the problem is uh, how many, uh, the, the demolition of Europe has already started, but uh, one thing is to get out of Europe in a, in, a, in a situation where you can survive on a, say, social basis. But if this carry on, maybe six months more, okay, destroying, destroying economy, destroying salary, um, also, the mood of the people is very poor today in Europe. Mm -hmm. What we can expect if this breaks down? We don't know. And uh, then, you know, there are Simone, many more uh, issues, for example, the freezing, and uh, which is going to be the, the first signal. Then yes. I, I leave to you. Well, I, can I just... Uh, yeah, yeah, up? of course. Just because, uh, yeah, I, I think one, one of the points that, that you, you, you touched upon which I think, at, coming at it from a historical standpoint, I think that the people talk about what we're about to go into, but it's difficult because we, we have many historical precedents, 
but nothing quite has ever expressed itself the way it is now, obviously, for a variety of reasons. But the two things that I think are very important is that I, you know, on the one hand, we have been printing money much in the same way as we saw in Weimar Germany, which is why I think maybe in, you know, coming out of 1923, when everyone became a billionaire, but no one could afford bread. Um, and people were like burning money to keep warm because there was no energy. It was all confiscated by the victor nations of World War II when they took over the Alsace, Lorraine uh, mining regions and everything else. Um, we, we have that aspect of money printing and infusions in the system today. We have $1.2 quadrillion or so approximately of derivatives, outstanding uh, speculative contracts that don't really have very much connection to the real world. They just look kind of good on on numbers, you know, on a, on a computer screen, but they don't really seem to, it's very difficult to quantify the value of the quality of the value. So we have this, this bubble upon bubble upon bubble supported by unpayable debts, which have been bundled, speculated upon, insured, speculated upon again on spot markets. So we have all of this almost like magical um, money making that has really taken over like a parasite. Since the 1990s, I mean, early 90s, this is where it really got out of hand. But at the other hand, so this is the inflationary aspect, but then we also have the uh, the deflationary aspect because in 1929 in the United States, when you had the stock market collapse, you know, that was that was a deflationary problem. You had people who speculated, the, the markets were overvalued, over overinflated. And, you know, at a certain moment when the broker call loans, because all of the brokers were, were taking loans they couldn't afford to pay, and there were some, something like eight, nine times overvalued. And when all of the broker call loans were called in at the exact same moment, it was an orchestrated pinprick because all of the people who were on, you know, JP Morgan's uh, preferred clients list who had insider information, they sold all of their assets when, when things were at the peak. And then they were able to purchase during the course of the Great Depression when things had collapsed, right? And it was the biggest wealth transfer we had seen in history. Uh, that resulted in a collapse of prices so that farmers, entrepreneurs could not, um, they couldn't, s the goods that they were producing were, pr were, were not allowing them to maintain the overhead cost of production. Yes. So they were going bankrupt at faster rates. So there had, that, that was, today we have sort of both aspects of the speculative frenzy, the money printing, which have both deflationary and hyperinflationary components to it. And I think that people, to solve this type of problem, it requires a, a different way of thinking. You cannot solve it within the parameters or the rules of the game that we are being given today by the central bankers or, or, or anybody uh, of that, of that you know, Davos type of, of thinking. You cannot solve it in their, in, their, in their rules. You have to break the rules that they want you to follow, which involves, you know, there, there's certain extreme things systemically that need to be done to defend people from the oncoming meltdown. That involves erasing a lot of the unpayable debts. They just can't be paid. You're, you know, if we if we treat them as though they could, we are going to destroy ourselves. So okay. we we need a, a a surgery, like a serious reconstructive surgery, to go into the patient and define what is the healthy tissue, and what is the what is the cancerous tissue, and and do this in a in a in a very serious way, uh, fast because we're running out of time. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. It's a, difficult, it's a difficult story because uh, uh, but, but Europe is much worse than the, the big message. Uh, being you in Canada or United States is something different to, to than, than stay, for example, in Europe because Europe, uh, you have two uh, two or three type of countries. You know, you have Germany on one, on one hand, Germany, say, um, Netherlands, uh, and then you have France, and something in between, and then you have Southern Europe. Uh, Hmm. It's yeah. impossible for us to stay together in yeah, this no. currency because it's totally impossible. Because uh, Europe was designed to be a deflationary, deflationary currency. Now that there is inflation, there is no defense for Europe. Uh, I feel that there's a big trick this thing, you know, because uh, uh, dollar is going up and inflation is going up for euro. Uh, for the euro, is going to be a challenge, an impossible challenge. Okay, hmm. so it's just a matter of time for everything cracks down but the real point is that we feel that also with this vaccine vaccination mood crazy to some extent uh, they understand that the situation is out of hands and maybe they prefer to have a, a messy situation in order to being able to manage uh, the, the issue 
uh, say, being able to give the blame to somebody else, okay? Because this problem is a, an economic problem. Uh, but we feel that with COVID, uh, they are trying to build a problem that is not existent in order to hide the real problem that yeah. would have done, okay? This is my best feeling. You cannot, you will not see this in the United States, okay? We will see first in Europe. Europe is the child, is the is the core of the of the crisis. This is my my personal opinion. Well, definitely Germany's situation as being one of the only countries that has retained its Mittelstand, its its small and medium industrial base that gives its uh, that that infuses real value into the system. That's vitally important, and every country must uh, have a real small medium enterprise driver that's the lifeblood of a society it's innovation uh, everything comes out of having that um so if germany is able to you know if they choose to leave the euro like tom luongo has pointed out um that will force a good crisis i think because everyone will the whole euro without germany doesn't work it, it already doesn't work with germany <laughs> as you pointed out there's just too much uh too many different differentiated types of, of economies but if they get out, that will force that type of crisis where people will then have to reevaluate going back to sovereign nation states, returning back to a pro-industrial way of thinking that they let go of decades ago. We have to get back to that way of, you know, you read a, an economics textbook from the 1960s. It's very different from the type of economics textbooks we, we, we train our, or brainwash our youth in today. Um, but it's, it's because it's competent. They, they actually understood that money can't just grow without a, a, an analogous growth of your real world assets, infrastructure, productivity that has to grow, that money has to be connected to the thing that supports human life. If it's not, no, it, you're doing something very, very destructive. Stop. <laughs> so, no, yeah. but in fact, you know, the end is already, uh, it, it's clear because uh, Everybody is wondering why Germany is so scared about, about inflation because of the 1920. No, not, not precisely. Because if you go to Goethe, uh, that is the, the biggest writer in the German culture, and you, if you go to the Faust, uh, that is one of the his best known uh, novel, uh, mm. you have Mephistophele, okay? Um, Mephistophele was uh, basically Lucifer. Okay, but why was Lucifer? Because he, he convinced the, the the emperor to create money that created inflation, and this inflation was destroying the life of, uh, of the German people. Okay, so this, the the scare of inflation uh, for Germany uh, was reflected in, uh, in practical terms in 1929, but uh, it was it's coming much before. You know, it's it's something in the root of the of the German culture. So it's just a matter of time. We need to be patient. The problem that they don't want in Europe, they don't want people to be patient because they, there is a kind of a witch hunt uh, today for the uh, vaccination. Yeah. I say uh, you, 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 you must do the vaccination, even if the vaccination, then you're going to feel sick for weeks, okay? Maybe you're going even to, to have serious problem, uh, but they want you to be vaccinated. Why? Why? Why this, this this situation? So possibly everything is connected, but let's see. But the important message from Europe to uh, say the, the the new world, <laughs> as we say <laughs> in Europe, uh, is this, and we we catch also your your reasoning. With this. Perfect, let's, see. Mm. let's let's move on. Let's move on to the next question that sure. may be well connected to what we're talking about, because we interviewed the uh, professor Valentina Zarkova who clearly told us that uh, in the coming years, there will be a lowering of temperatures. This finding that's supported by scientific, scientific evidence is not in line with the official narrative. If there will be more cold, there will, be pro there will probably be fewer resources. It all seems to fit into a well thought out plan. What are, you, what are your thoughts on, on, on this? That's very, yeah, that, that's become a very controversial topic for some reason, because um, there's a, a certain consensus that we have all been expected to believe blindly in, which is that the earth has been warming specifically because of human industrial activity now uh, for some years. And we're, go we're going to, as we're told repeatedly, 
uh, be the pure cause of the total destruction of nature. The earth will burn, um, floods will will wreak havoc over the world, and and the Statue of Liberty will be underwater. With it. That's what Al Gore showed us in his in his documentary. And yet, you have all sorts of astroclimatologists who have been coming out saying something very different uh, for quite some time. This is not new, you know. And back in the 1970s, this was more common when. Um, a lot of scientists, the general consensus by 1976-77 was that the world was indeed entering an, a new ice age. Um, there was even a documentary in 77 by Len narrated, narrated by Leonard Nimoy, which people can watch online, where they made a point from 1944 until that point, there, there was a consistent tendency of cooling. But you got to keep in mind, at the same period from 1944 to 77, that was also an industrial boom after World War II the amount of so-called so CO2 emissions were astronomically high compared to every other point before that. So why that period of 30-year cooling? And now, as you just pointed out, um, astroclimatologists, people looking at the behavior of the, the electromagnetic field of the sun, of what's going on with these, these more subtle cycles, are all ringing the alarm bell yet again, saying we are indeed heading not into warming, all the signs are showing us a plunge into cooling, whether that's going to be a, a small mini ice age like we saw in the 17th century with the, the Maunder Minimum, you know, when the, when the sun didn't exhibit any, um, any, any, any sunspots, there was very little solar activity because when you see sunspots, that's a sign of solar activity and the sun goes through 11 year cycles of maximum minimum um, activity, which corresponds to certain you know, tr changes we see on the earth. But for that period in the 17th century, it was called the Little Ice Age. Very cold summers, very cold winters. Um, it had, you know, frozen over on the Thames uh, for a long time. So are we going to see something like that? Or are we going to see a deeper plunge? And I think that that's, that's something that I think people should be actually having serious international discussions about over the fact that if you look at the longer cycles of the, the Ice Age records, we currently take for granted that this period of warming that we've been living in for the past 10,000 years is not the norm. This is an anomaly because, you know, every store, every culture has its flood myths, right? Native American and Indian and Chinese, and we have Noah's Ark. Every culture has developed flood myths for a reason. They didn't know what they were looking at, but about 10,000 10, years ago, sea, sea levels rose uh, by 500 or so feet because we had the end of an ice age, the ice caps melted. And so there was a lot of destruction. People didn't know what to, what to explain that with. And they said, oh, okay, the gods are punishing us for our, our, our sins, you know, or various things. Um, so this is called the Holocene warming period. This, this little 10,000 year, year blip is the Holocene warming period. And according to the previous blips of warming, we've had about six or seven in the past um, million years. The norm has been cold. Usually it's 80 to 90,000 years of cold, deep ice age. And then you have these little blips of warming that endure for eight to 12,000 years. And then it goes back down into the normal cold, the ice age. And then you get these blips. We're, we're at the end of one of those blips of warming. The, the, so we should be thinking seriously about, you know, the fact that one, dinosaurs and other species of the, of the earth before humans never had the potential, the mental, creative, cognitive potential to identify this, act on the future, and utilize the power of reason using science technology to uh, save people from these sorts of cataclysms. Human beings are the first species endowed with this attribute. So that, that, that means something. We should, that, that right there is very big. But we should be having discussions on how do we stop the, the type of death that will occur by the destruction of, of food production under the context of an ice age, the food production doesn't do well, right? <laughs> it gets very cold. It's already, people are going to die already across Europe and North America because of energy prices and unreliable energy sources like windmills and solar panels. How, how are solar panels going to work in 20, 30 years as it gets colder and colder? It's not going to get warmer. Uh, they won't work. You need to have reliable forms of energy that are going to allow you to um, keep people alive and, and, and healthy. 
Um, and new forms of agriculture need to be developed. New technologies like ag aeroponics need to be developed to, to allow for the cultivation of mass production of food at high enriched nutritional value. And aeroponics is a good way of doing that. Nuclear power, third, fourth generation nuclear energy with a look towards fusion power that we should be already getting, getting on board with sooner than later. These are the sorts of things that we would want to do if we cared about people. But unfortunately, those running, I think, our, our current energy policy and, and science global warming policy, they don't care about people very much, unfortunately. They say they do, but they don't. I feel that uh, uh, long term, and I agree 100% with you, uh, um, I, I, make, I prefer to be much more simple in my, in my reasoning. I feel that this energy problem also is connected to a kind of cold weather expectation that has already materialized to some extent. But if this is true, um, in the next three to six months, you know, we are going to see a, a substantial increase in demand due to the need of uh, warming, you know, houses and uh, not, not industrial processes, I would say. Uh, but this thing is going to be quite stiff in the, in, the, in, the, in the transitionary period, say, between now and the next two years. Let's see, because um, also energy, you know, that is pivotal to, to the inflation uh, if inflation go up, you know, it means that energy must go up. And mm -hmm. if inflation goes up, you know, and uh, uh, say, uh, for example, Euro-peripheral country like Italy or Spain declare that inflation is, I don't know, 6%, uh, then uh, <laughs> the, 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 the astronomical increase in the gross domestic product announced by Mario Draghi is, is, is going to become negative, okay? So imagine... Draghi that has uh, published, you know, something, some incredible result from the PN, PNR, PNRR um, due to European investment, and then we end up, you know, with a, a GDP that is negative, so a recession. So uh, I feel that the perfect storm is, is ahead of us, okay? We just need to understand how to cope with that. Uh, and try, the reason for this, say, interview today is just to clarify the situation people in order for people to understand what is behind the curve because the rhetoric from the ECB or from the central banks is similar it's the same all over the place okay we need to try to uh, explain people that there might be something different okay uh, in order for them to be prepared and also for us to be prepared but uh, yeah. we don't need to be say angry or say warm about the situation uh, we need to we don't need to challenge this, you know. The important thing is to explain this. And things will come easily, just a matter of time, okay? This is my opinion, okay? Because it's too big the lie that we see today, you know, it's impossible. If somebody's telling you if, if prices are going up, it doesn't mean that you have inflation, okay? This is a new, this is a, a new theory that is like, it's much more than Big Bang theory, okay? Something... <laughs> Well, you know, it, it really is a, uh, the, the one that, that I found the most entertaining recently was the, wh where, where I've heard it said that the reason for the explosion in energy prices is because the economy, the economic recovery was just too intense. The engine turning on happened too fast, caught everyone off guard, how good the economy is, how health, you know, how quickly it recovered. And uh, that, that just, it, it caused a, a, a draining of our energy and now we've got a crisis and it's like, are you serious? You just consciously I, just destroyed the, <laughs> your economy for the past 18 months and you're saying things are so good when we don't have job, I mean, joblessness is increasing, inflation is increasing, everything bad is increasing. So why would you say that? And I think that this actually touches on the issue of, of the fallacy of climate change caused by human beings, or at least the fallacy, I should say, not of climate change, because that's true. Climate is changing. The fallacy of global warming caused by uh, carbon dioxide which is not a scientific, that is a political statement justified by computer models. So that, the COVID issue, being afraid of this invisible thing, creature, uh, COVID, which has justified our abolishment of, of freedoms uh, around the world, you know, and, and the acceptance of a, of a great reset. And what you've just said about the detachment of economic analysis from reality, it's all based on a common um, a handicap, a, a, a mental sleight of hand, which is ultimately very similar. It's the idea that computer models will think for us according to whoever controls the computer modeling of the, your climate models, 
your your uh, COVID models in terms of like who's who's project who is who is selecting the data sets that are incorporated into those models, and then who controls how they're projected into the future to create these scary future scenarios, right? In 2050, where the earth is boiled over or the world is now all dead because of a new uh, black plague. Um, or in the case of the economists, you know, they're all using computer models that are ivory tower that have no bearing in the, pr the principles of reality that they're just not looking at. Um, they're, they could, they're not that hard to look at, but they, they've been trained in, by years of, of bad schooling and, and then bad culture. When you go into your, your, your business practice or macroeconomic field, you're, you're, it's just all of this bad training is being reinforced to put your mind, your personal powers of thought, shut it off, let the computer model think for you, and you just become a good little automaton machine-like person with no bearing in reality. And it's, it's creepy. It's creepy. Yes. <laughs> yes. I think I think today we we explored a lot of uh, a lot of uh, possible scenarios, mm. and uh, I think I think uh, uh, I, I want to thank you, Matt, for your for your uh, for all the information you gave us today, and Marco uh, Rocco as well for having supported me in this uh, in this interview. That, uh, as Marco pointed out before, uh, the, the goal of this interview is to explain to people what is going on, you know, in order to prepare them, you know, for the crash, it might happen, you know. So thank you very much, Matt, for everything. And uh, let's stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. Hey, ciao.